Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our February Ordinary Council meeting. Firstly, I'd like to read some of the um, some of the parameters and conditions around our meeting. Um, so, East Gippsland Shire Council live streams, records, and publishes its meetings via webcasting to enhance the accessibility of its meetings to the broader East Gippsland community. These recordings are also archived and available for viewing by the public or used for publicity or information purposes. At the appropriate times during the meeting, any members of the gallery who are addressing council will have their image, comments or submissions recorded. No other person has the right to record council meetings unless approval has been granted by the chair. Please ensure that your mobile phones and other electronic devices are turned off or in silent mode for the duration of the meeting. Now, councillors, I would like to remind you to make sure that your microphone is turned on when you are addressing the gallery. Members of the public wishing to speak, we will ensure that the microphone is turned on for you. So in, so in opening, on behalf of Council, I would like to acknowledge the Gunai Kurnai people, the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered and pay our respects to their elders both past and present. Uh, item 1.2, Mr CEO, do we have any apologies? Uh, no apologies, Mr Mayor. Thank you. 1.3, declarations of conflict of interest. Uh, none have been received, Mr Mayor. Thank you. 1.4. Confirmation of minutes. That the minutes of the ordinary council meeting Tuesday the 17th of December be confirmed. Do we have, okay, we have a, a mover in Councillor Rotino and a seconder in Councillor Reeves. All those in favour? That is nine for, none against. Thank you. Now our next, next meeting, our ordinary council meeting, will be Tuesday the 3rd of March 2020 to be held here at the Corporate Centre at 273 Main Street, Bensdale, commencing at 6pm. 1.6, do we have any requests for leave of absence? None have been received, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Requests to speak about your community project? There are no requests tonight, Mr Mayor. Thank you. 1.8, public question time. There are no public questions, Mr Mayor. That's a, a request to speak to an item. Our uh, 1.9 is our record of assemblies of councillors. So um, could ask uh, Mr Canizaro to speak to this, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, in accordance with section 88, um, subsection two, um, this report is presented to record a formal record of assemblies of councillors uh, for your adoption. Thank you. So we have Councillor Rotino moves that and Councillor Tui seconds it. All those in favour? There's nine, four, zero against. Thank you, councillors. Now we have uh, <coughs> petitions. There are none tabled, Mr Mayor. Thank you. So we move to, um, to item 2.1. Notice of rescission number 1-2020, rescission of on block resolution of council meeting December 17, 2019, items 5.1.1 to items 5.1.6. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to take notice that it is my intention to move at the ordinary meeting of council to be held Tuesday, 4th of February, 2020 at 6 p.m. or at any adjourn adjournment of that meeting that the following resolution of council made at the meeting held on Tuesday 17th of December 2019 and referenced in the minutes of that meeting as that item 5.11 to 5.16 be moved on block and adopted be rescinded. I'm happy to second that uh, notice Mr. Mayor. Thank you Councillor Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
I'll keep my rationale brief. <clears throat> Uh, the Council rescind immediately the motions 5.1.1 to 5.1.6 that were passed on block at the 17th of December 2019 Council meeting on the grounds that one, the Council were not able to debate for or against the items 5.1.1 to 5.1.6 that have potential to significantly impact the community. Point two, moving items on block is not consistent with transparency principles and may infer a predetermined decision. Point three, on block decision making is not in accordance with principles of administrative law and therefore not good administrative practice. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Would anyone else wish to speak to this uh, rescission motion? I think uh, I'm happy to speak in favour of the motion, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Good, thank you. If I can draw Council's attention to the three dot points provided as the base of the rationale. It is imperative that uh, East Gippsland Shire be able to be accountable and open and transparent in its decision making. The on block voting for items 5.1.1 to 5.1.6 at the ordinary meeting on the 17th of December ran in opposition to that uh, aim of council. There were other matters as well. I c commend uh, Councillor Jackson Robert's motion before Council this evening and encourage councillors to support the matter. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ellis. Uh, would anyone wish to speak against? Okay. Well, then I. Councillor Reeves. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, Councillor Roberts, thanks for bringing uh, this. Um, notice of rescission to the table. But um, I'm, I'm a little surprised because uh, I moved that on block uh, motion back in December and, uh, and, uh, and it was actually seconded by Councillor Peltz at the time. Um, but Councillor Peltz has obviously changed her mind on this matter. I think it's really important that um, all of those items that were discussed were briefed to councillors over the course of more than a month in the councillor briefings and councillors had ample opportunity to digest and understand the content, the import, and, um, and to make decisions around that, and to, um, to contribute that if they wanted those matters to be moved on block or not. And in fact, on that night, Councillor Peltz asked one item be removed, so it could be discussed separately, and we did. So there was ample opportunity to do that. And I think um, it, it um, reminds us that we need to be present at briefings, all of us, to be able to uh, be fully equipped councillors to understand the uh, matters that are going on. And uh, no, being, not being in attendance uh, is not our problem that requires a rescission that stymies the further discussions and movements of council and the decisions of council. Council needs to look forward, not back. That's the way we're going, a rescission motion takes us back, takes us back to 17th of December. And for many of us, um, you know, the past is not where we want to go, especially in these times of disasters. We need to keep going forward. And I remind councillors, you need to be attending, you need to be listening, you need to be participating, and we need to be facing forward. Councillors, um, there's no need to, to rescind these motions. This, these, these matters have been discussed and decided on, and the community expects those to be acted on now. Thank you, uh, Councillor Reeves. Councillor Roberts, your right of reply. Sorry. Councillor Peltz, you did have your hand up. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'd like to actually um, speak in favour of the rescission. As Councillor Reeves indicated, I did second this, and I have to apologise. I do feel at the time it was confusing um, any time a on-block decision has been raised, um, a little bit of out of control happens and you don't actually really get the full gist of what you're actually voting on. Um, I think it's a, quite unprofessional. I don't think it's in the, um, the ideal of the local laws. Um, I think the agenda that week was loaded um, and we were very tired with the run-up to Christmas. I think the issues um, arising um, from that night were complex and I did feel that we weren't comprehensive of entertaining each item 
for its merit and for what it was actually um, meant to be discussed. We missed out on opportunities of debate, um, both for and against, on all of the items that were moved on block. Um, I also tried to rescind another um, motion, um, which I'm disappointed, um, which was 7.3, um, and unfortunately, um, it was not recognised, and I felt that was also um, a major contract that needed to be entertained. Uh, Mayor, point of order. Uh, what is your uh, point of order? So my point is that the council is not talking to the matter at hand, and uh, we need to stay focused on that. I don't see a point of order there, Mr Mayor. Could I ask uh, Mr Canizaro perhaps to comment on, on, the, on, these, uh, on the point of order, please? With respect, Mr Mayor, it's up to you as the Chair to make the decision as to whether it's a point of order or not. It's not for the Governance Officer to make that decision. I argue that uh, Councillor Pelt is speaking to the matter. It was a large and complicated issue. Another point of order, Mr Mayor. Um, I think that you should be given the opportunity to make the decision without being interrupted by another councillor. As just happened, Mr. Mayor. I, there is no issue with you seeking clarification of the mm. procedure. I would, I would still, I would still wish to seek clarification from Mr. Canizaro. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, normally, you would just talk to the uh, item at hand, and that is the 5.1.1 to 5.1.6 rescission. Um, well, I will um, I will accept Councillor Peltz's uh, speaking, but please could you um, perhaps uh, you, go Mr. down Mayor. go down the path of, of this motion that's on I the was table? I'm really trying to highlight an, an analogy for the community so that they could understand our processes. Um, with that stated, I'd, I'd like to say that um, we felt that there was. Um, serious consequences to our community um, in regards to these rescissions not being entertained and financially they will be impactful um, unnecessarily. So thank you for that, Mr Mayor. I um, wish to say just only that. Thank you, Councillor Peltz. Now, Councillor Roberts. Sorry, sorry, another one. Councillor Rutino, which you wish to speak for or against? Could I have another point of order? Would it be in order for me to speak? I know we've had our opportunity before, but in favour of the rescission? Well, that's that's what we're doing at the moment, Councillor Buckley. The, we, we are still open for debate, and okay, uh, Councillor you. Rutino has um, requested to speak for or against. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I am speaking against the uh, motion in relation to the comments around accountable. We're accountable for every decision that's made in this chamber, whether it's on block or individual. It is an open and transparent process. Uh, opportunity was given to remove individual um, items if they were of any concern. That opportunity was afforded to everybody around this table. Not a murmur was made about any of this uh, until we received the rescission motion. There was no confusion. It was largely procedural and it's a very efficient way of doing business. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Rutino. Now, Councillor Buckley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd like to point out that uh, Mark, the council reef, has been away in China many times when we've been doing these uh, uh, briefings and so forth. So I think that's a, a rather ambitious comment to be critical of others that uh, haven't been able to attend um, to, to uh, these uh, briefings at times. I know you're on a noble mission over there, Councillor Reeve, and I commend you for that. But uh, there's a fair bit of give and take in this sort of stuff. Often, sometimes take. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Buckley. Is there any more uh, wish to speak for or against? Yeah, Councillor O'Connell. Uh, I'll just like to reiterate uh, Councillor Reeves and Councillor Rotino's comments. Um, and just further to the um, comment that it's not consistent with principles of transparency. 
uh, it does stipulate that there are occasions uh, where a number of simple reports, such as what was on the night of uh, December 17th, such as the election period policy and the report on the Audit and Risk Committee and so forth, that um, efficiency may override transparency. And in that case, we were here till almost 11 o'clock discussing a number of planning matters and, and those uh, things you know, shouldn't be voted on block, but in, in cases like this, I think um, we do have many matters to discuss and it's important to spend the time on those things that really need the debate and these items did not require that. Thank you, Councillor O'Connell. That would leave the way for you to reply, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Mr Mayor and Councillors. While I do appreciate comments from Councillors, I did raise the I did raise the issue um, on the night of discussion while this was while this was occurring. So um, I did raise my point that I had concerns with the issues that were being considered. Um, I did also raise concerns during the briefing session that Mark wasn't at. So I, I granted I've not been at all the briefing sessions, but um, give and take, Mark, you're in China again, and there was some quite robust and it was really respectful debate around some of these items but debate nonetheless, so there wasn't necessarily a finished story. One of the items, one of the administrative items that was just mentioned was uh, the $1.5 million in cuts to spending. Um, this was item 5.1.2, review of organisations operations, which included 1.5 million in cuts to spending. Some of these items included removing the pension or rate rebate, as well as slashing the community grants funding, with no guarantee as to where the funds would be allocated instead. Now, it is true that council reviews spending on a yearly basis, and amendments to these programs is normal. However, when items like this are listed on our public agenda, it's our responsibility to ensure that we remain transparent and open during the process. On block motion does not support this. While I don't want to get caught up in the details of the items encompassed by the on block decision, the reality is that it is poor practice and should, should not be encouraged. To take a council off guard by moving items on block is clumsy, slow, and often hurts the purpose for which is intended. Now, I would like to refer to a couple of points from the Victorian Ombudsman's report. Investigation into the transparency of local government decision making dated December 2016. I quote, on block voting may lack transparency as consensus may be re reached on on block matters outside open council meetings or individual councillor votes may be or at least appear to be predetermined. The absence of public debate on items voted on block may have an impact on the transparency of the reasons for a decision, and it also states that there is potential for on block voting to breach common law procedural fa fairness requirements and procedural fa fairness rules aimed to ensure decision making, excuse me, decision makers act without bias when making a decision and give all relevant parties the opportunity to be heard. Excuse me. Legal advice obtained by the Local Government Association of South Australia about on-block voting warns against the practice, particularly where the rights and interests of third parties are affected, and in some cases, some decisions made on-block may open counsel to legal challenge. While some of the items considered in the decision may appear trivial and purely administrative, the fact that the only way of dealing with this matter is via this process, so it's tiringly clumsy and a perfect example of why on-block decision making is so flawed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. That being said, I will put this um, this um, motion to the vote. So all those in favour? All those against? The motion is passed. Those against are Councillor Tui, Councillor Rotino, Councillor Reeves and Councillor O'Connell. Thank you. So moving on, we have, uh, is there, uh, for item three here, do we have any um, deferred business, Mr CEO? Uh, there is no deferred business, Mr Mayor. All right, that moves us on to councillor reports. Um, I would uh, encourage all councillors to, to give their monthly reports, so I'll start um, in a clockwise direction and ask councillor Tui. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, it's been a fairly busy time clearly for, uh, for all councillors. Um, the one thing I would like to concentrate on in the last month that I, uh, that I did was I attended the uh, Australia Day celebration out at, um, out at Lindeneau. 
excuse me, which I must say I've not done for the past, uh, I've not done before, um, given that you, John, have been doing that in the past. But uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience to be out there in what I refer to as my hometown, uh, where all my children grew up, went to school, and uh, the, the highlight of the day was the school children uh, that attended and read some poems that they had uh, that they had written, and even though we we've obviously been through some uh, some pretty hard times fairly recently, um, the the wonderful uplifting poems that were read out on the day were were just wonderful. So I I, uh, I must say it was a very enjoyable day, and um, John, you sadly you missed out, but it was lovely. Thank you. Councillor Rotino. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. In the interest of efficiency, I've uh, tabled my um, council report for the month and I'll move my report on block just to keep things moving along. But uh, on a serious note, uh, Mr Mayor, what I'd like to do is for you, with your indulgence, uh, in respect of what's happened here in Black Summer Fires, uh, move a motion of condolence for the lives that have been lost in this event and also a motion of thanks for everyone that's helped us. Uh, Mayor, I'll also move my um, council report on block and table it, and uh, for those who'd like to read it. It um, follows the same pattern as the last three months where I foreshadowed and forewarned in uh, November and December of the fire events, and uh, now I detail some of those experiences in my report. Thank you. Councillor O'Connell. Uh, I'd just like to make mention of the um, Australia Day award winners um, that were in Omeo uh, last Australia Day weekend. Uh, Young Citizen of the Year, Becky Plowman and Lee Mitchell. The community event was the Poets Walk at Swifts Creek and the Citizen of the Year was Jim Flanagan. So congratulations to the recipients. Thank you, Councillor Buckley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, the Australia Day celebrations at Bruthen, a sombre a mood prevailed and the event was poorly attended. The reason being the intense fires that had occurred in the area and some are uh, still active. The uh, two deaths and the little boy lost issue had not been uh, resolved at that time. And I'm pleased to say that it was, uh, you know, came good shortly afterwards. Uh, on the plus side, the uh, local line splendidly catered for the event with plenty left over, which was offered uh, as takeaways, you beauty. So, uh, Mr. Uh, here we go. There were no uh, awards given on the day because of the confusion that was to be sorted out later. So, Mr. Mayor, thank you for assigning Bruthen to me. It was an interesting exercise in seeing how well most people cope with adversity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Mr Mayor. <clears throat> Firstly, as, all, as has already been mentioned, I need to acknowledge and sympathise with everybody that has been impacted by these bushfires. The bushfires that have been burning for two months and will likely continue to burn for some time to come. Our volunteer firefighters have put everything on the line. They left families, homes and jobs to find a, fight a new kind of war that we've never before experienced on this scale, a feat of bravery that I've trouble putting into words. However, as I was dwelling on this, there is another group that has been as equally as brave and valuable during this crisis, but I think it does not get anywhere near enough acknowledgement. I'm referring to the in individuals that were defending property and lives and the emergency services were spread too thin. I myself was in Buck and South trying to help defend my grandparents' property when the fire fronts rolled in. The isolation and helplessness that was felt over the next 36 hours as, as fires approached from three sides is not something I'll soon forget. After the power and phones went out, the only evidence of life was the occasional crackle on the UHF radio. This provided basic updates on the increasing severity and the location of the fires. However, what became obvious from the radio was that the potentially dozens of unknown community members were doing what they could to organise and defend the little, little community of Buchan, as well as elsewhere across the country. 
In that time, while quietly hoping that the CFA would arrive and save the day, the only flashing light I saw was atop a tractor operated by an enthusiastic, enthusiastic neighbour. Not a fire truck or a police car, but a tractor equipped with nothing but a shovel. This was surprisingly comforting at 3 a.m. Comforting because it was a reminder that all, although everything else felt help, helpless, the community was standing up to defend itself. Ordinary people were fighting an impossible battle and winning. I can confidently say that if it wasn't for these people, dozens if not hundreds more properties and potentially lives would be lost. These people will probably remain anonymous, but they deserve the highest praise for their altruism. They're a great credit to our community and they should be acknowledged. Thank you. Well spoken, Jackson. Councillor Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Roberts, for uh, a, a wonderful uh, few words then. I won't try to take anything away from that report, but I'll just simply follow some of my other fellow councillors and advise that I have um, submitted a full written report for my monthly activities and acknowledge not only the, um, the recipients and winners of the Australia Day Awards, but also the service groups that have provided such uh, outstanding uh, service to our communities over the past six weeks. Uh, and I refer in particular to um, the CFA, um, Lions Clubs, uh, Rotary Clubs and other volunteers in our community. I would also like to particularly thank the ADF and look forward to Council recognising the services rendered to our community um, by not only our volunteers and uh, response people but also the ADF at an appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Peltz. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll keep mine brief too, but um, I wanted to raise something different um, from my fellow councillors because I think it's a really important point <coughs> of this whole procedure. Um, and I can only say what's gone on um, in our region feels like it's been a lifetime ago since um, our last ordinary council meeting on the 17th of December just seven weeks ago. Besides the overwhelming event of the disastrous bushfire engulfing the whole of our region, embattling scorching temperatures and roller coaster on and off again evacuation circumstances for the majority of people in our community, the people of our region have endured enough. I myself have been on a roller coaster of emotions on all different levels. I think it's something that many of us have all shared um, we've all had the same feelings and I believe it's actually okay to feel vulnerable and inadequate, stressed and confused. I think it's a really important point. Um, from my experience working um, with the lovely ladies who I'd like to make a, um, a special note of because they're outstanding, um, Wendy Wu and Jodie Crane and their families that opened up the um, Lucknow Donation Centre under duress from um, the authorities. They were told not to do it, but they um, supplied our community with the most outstanding necessary um, support in their time of need. So working down there, I had the privilege of meeting many people that came in and a lot of them were um, aged men, probably in their 50s, and they had no one. And I really want to reach out to this group and say, come in and talk to everyone, come and, um, you know, it's okay to feel vulnerable, it's actually okay to feel stressed and confused and, and not knowing what to do. And I think at some stage there should be some kind of recognition um, for support for them, and I think there is with the, um, the hospital authorities, but I'd like to see some kind of um, men's support barbecue um, exactly raising concerns for those issues because I feel it's very necessary um, I've been able to rekindle my sewing expertise by making um, bedding for the injured wildlife, which I've really, really enjoyed, um, making bat wraps and um, joey bags and things like that, and, and networking with some past friends um, that I actually did fashion college with in Geelong. And, um, you know, we're, it's been really, uh, throughout it all, it's been quite amazing, um, the support that you get. And with that said, I'd like to say, um, through the darkness of everything, the, the donations, the, 
support and the contributions to our community have been overwhelming and outstanding. Um, and I think, you know, it, it, in times of need, um, people stand up to the occasion and, and in 12 months' time we'll be saying, wow, look at our community, it's awesome. And I feel extremely proud to be able to represent it at this level, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor Peltz. <coughs> um, I, I too purchased a ticket on that same roller coaster. I couldn't accept it as a gift because I would have had to declare it. Not a gift. <laughs> um, firstly, I would like to thank my fellow councillors for their support during this dreadful month. Um, getting out and about in the community supporting me in the remote regions where I couldn't get. Um, I appreciate that help. The number, the number of events or things and people that I've met over this uh, period between the last meeting, but particularly from New, New Year's Eve onwards, um, that's, it's, it's been extraordinary. I've, I've had um, a lot to do with the affected people, but I've also tried to keep the normal council business going, um, where we've had other events, other people to meet. So I will go to Australia Day, firstly, and uh, congratulate a great citizen of our region in Blake Hollands for his contribution through legacy in his area of the Tambo Valley. And uh, although Mr Hollands couldn't come to the ceremony, he was he was, um, he was represented, well represented by one of his colleagues and uh, I just say again, I congratulate him and for a wonderful lifetime of contribution to our community. Following that, of course, there, was, there were other ceremonies, um, particularly on, uh, on Australia Day at Lakes Entrance where 19, 19 uh, new Australians pledged their loyalty to Australia and took their citizenship ceremony. So that was really good and uh, as usual, just a, a wonderful bunch, diverse bunch of people um, who are now members of our community. So during the crisis, I, I was um, visited the, uh, the relief centre at the Bensdale City Oval, sometimes multiple times a day to check, on, um, to check on the people who were really suffering and had nowhere else to go. But on the very first morning, I'd been out to uh, Sarsfield and took a drive because many of our council employees live out there, some of whom were severely impacted. But it was to just check on a couple where I, I knew where they lived and to see that their houses were intact, but they, were, they had gone and were safe and their families were safe. But during that drive, I just for some reason took notice of a, a cedar home which a spark would have ignited it, but it was still intact. I went back to the, um, to the relief centre and a gentleman from Sarsfield came up to me and he said, have you been out to Sarsfield? And I said, well, yes, I have. He said, oh, he said, I've got a house, cedar home in Sarsfield. I was just wondering, would you, if you've been into High Street, would you have seen it? And I said, as a matter of fact, I have, and it is still there. And he was so relieved because he didn't expect that his home would have still been there. So he was, that was the best news he had had all day. Um, and then, to be sure I hadn't, it wasn't an illusion, I drove back to Sarsfield and had a second look, and it was still there. So I was just so pleased because it would have been terrible to have made a dreadful mistake and told him something that was untrue. So, at the same time as I went to the relief centre, I also visited our sale yards. And I feel so proud that council could have offered those for all those people with, with vulnerable stock, particularly horses, but it even got down to chooks that had been brought in to be saved from the fire. And I, I feel so grateful that council could su support the community in such a way, because at one stage there were 400 horses there, among other things, with goats and chooks, etc. Uh, I'll, I'll, and I might add, hats off to Mel at the sale yards. He did an incredible job. 
he actually worked himself to such a frazzle that at the minute I think he's taking time out um, from his race horses, which is his, his passion in life. Um, but I do wish he comes back on board because uh, Can I Creek's coming up. <laughs> I also met and spoke with and thanked the many convoys of hay that came into our region immediately. And I was, oh my God. <laughs> Am I gonna kill that? <laughs> it's, been, it's been turned down all afternoon and somehow or other the, the knob's been bumped in my pocket. So there you go, somebody who's definitely wanted to speak to me. Sorry, um, I'll have to put the money in the jar. So those people, and it mounts now to hundreds and hundreds of trucks from across Victoria that have turned up in our region. And it was, and it was great to meet with them and they were pleased to be thanked, um, although they would have done it anyway. That's just the spirit of people. They also met and helped to unload many trucks of other goods that came to our area, donated goods, um, particularly lots of food and things like that, that to support us. And the generosity of other people in our community towards us in our time of absolute crisis um, is, is, has been overwhelming. Um, and also the monetary gifts that have gone into the, uh, the recognised charities, which are now being uh, dispersed in, in, in very large amounts to the community that have been affected. On my second trip to Buchan, I actually went and inspected the damage at Canai Creek. I've never ever been there before. And I went in and I actually had a film crew with me. And I said to them, this is the place to talk about what's happened. And I stood under half a horseshoe that was the finished post. It was, um, the one half was melted and the other half was still there. And I looked around and I thought to myself, because I'd seen the sign going in and it said, next meeting, February 15. And I looked around at the damage and the destruction and I thought, you know, this community of Buchan, they really are doers with some materials and a working bee. I think they could get this up. Well, congratulations to the citizens of Buchan and surrounds because Canai Creek is on, on the 15th of February. So. I have to take my hat off to them because um, they've just risen up and done what they do best and work for their communities and I congratulate them for that. The, the, the latest thing is um, Carly Knight um, from the Horse Centre has organised to have um, um, Tom Curtin, who was a poet and a musician, come to the Ben Style Racecourse this Friday evening and uh, she's been overwhelmed with the acceptances from people who wish to come. I think she's up to about 1,500. Now, it's, a, it's a, just a gold coin donation. Uh, she just wants people to, it was going to be a drought one, but she had to change it in midstream and she's made it a bushfire um, recovery concert. And, uh, and thank you to Carly for that. Um, as, as council, we have supported her um, along the way to get this up and running. And uh, any, any of the, the donations in the gold coins is all, all being donated straight to the Gippsland Emergency Relief Fund. So uh, anyone who's out there listening and wants to come and have a, just a, a, a fun time to try and forget some of the uh, tragedies. Well, I've met with um, <coughs> Prime Minister Scott Morrison wonderful that he could come to our region and offer his support, substantial support. Our Premier Daniel Andrews has been down here multiple times and I've met with him and he's been great support. We've, uh, we've, we've had um, Twiggy Forest of um, Fortescue Medals with his, um, he has a, a fund and he's available to, to assist uh, wherever he can. So that was great of him. Um, the Governor-General paid us a visit. And I'd just like to say one thing. He, he's a wonderful man. He spent a lot of time talking to people. I got a text at about 11 o'clock that evening as he was flying back to Canberra and his press sec secretary said, the Governor-General, first of all, he said, appreciate the visit, loved it. Um, he said, the Governor-General never says a lot. 
and he was very measured in his response. And the next sentence was, he cannot, we cannot shut him up. He <laughs> keeps talking about the beautiful people of our region and how, how good they were. So I felt that was a real, you know, signature of, of East Gippsland and its communities. So that brings me to the last part. I'm sorry if it's taken so long, but this has been important to me. So meeting all those people, um, heads of government, um, and, uh, and of course there was one other in Canberra last week which was to meet a very famous Australian who was organising the, the distribution of something like $2 billion of Commonwealth money, and that was Sir Peter Cosgrove. And what an honour it was to shake his hand. But the most important people in this last month that I've met have been our impacted communities and the way they have behaved and the way they have resolved to recover. And I just applaud them. So thank you. Uh, Mr Mayor. So, yes, sorry, Councillor Rattino, I was just about to get to you. Um, we left you with a motion on the table, which I thought if we finished our discussion, our monthly reports, that we would come back to you. So, yes, so please go ahead. Thanks for your indulgence, Mr Mayor. If we could move the motion of uh, condolence for the lives lost in the Black Summer fires and a motion of thanks for everyone that has helped us. Thank you. Second, and Councillor Peltz. I'd say all those in favour. It's unanimous. Thank you. Now our next item is 5.1.1. And it's a planning permit application 335-2019-P. Use and development of land for a dwelling and a shed and alteration to access to a road zone category one at CA4 section B 1359 Great Alpine Road, Sarsfield. Now we have a request to speak. So would uh, Jamie Savory please come forward? Um, Jamie, you can speak. You will, will not be able to ask questions, but councillors, you may ask Jamie questions. So welcome. Thanks for my five minutes, councillors, to discuss as much as I can regarding my application to build my own home on my own farm. I request any planning scheme policy questions. Can you please address my consultant, Courtney? Based on my professional life of integrity, accuracy, guidelines, regulation and honesty, I struggle with the process I've been through so far. In my 15 year career, I've dealt with a significant amount of banks, solicitors, real estate agents, surveyors, town planners and even car dealers. But I can tell you I've never experienced such an inconsistent and misleading process that allows an environment where it's accepted that employees' personal opinions can change our community's livelihoods with no consequences or accountability. A list of facts for you all to hear. I was well aware that the property I was purchasing in Sarsfield required a permit to construct a dwelling as this is a section two use in the planning scheme due to the zoning and size of the property. I also note this is not a section three use and is not prohibited. I had a pre-application appointment completed in August to discuss my intentions where were with this property and also the intentions of the neighbouring property to be purchased by my brother and his wife. The interview went for approximately one hour and I was encouraged to apply with the emphasis on the farm management plan. Not one reason was made evident to me as to the Shire refusing my application unless an objection was received. I understand that this is not a guarantee for a permit, but given the precedence the planning department has set with issuing 18 very similar permits last year, I certainly did not think I would end up here. In addition to my experience with my own clients, I completed my additional due diligence via your online portal, which showed me evidence that there is a precedent set for this type of application being approved. The cost to me to date is $15,000, but given the strong recommendation to go through the prior process, 
I thought that this is a price I had to pay. My application was logged in, lodged in October, which it's also become apparent to me that the, the planner that I received my initial positive encouraging advice from declared a conflict of interest at time of submission and handballed my application to a different planner. My question is why did he give me that advice to begin with if he felt conflicted? I was informed, I, oh, actually, sorry, my objection has, my application has no objections, was approved by Vic Roads and also Catchment Management Authority. I was informed mid-December that the Shire was recommending refusal on my application, which I was absolutely blown away with, considering not once has anyone spoken to me from the Shire, nor have they asked for any further information regarding what their concern actually was. I continued to do my own research and I requested for a copy of the Rural Land Use Strategy, as this had, could have significant, significantly impacted the outcome given the rural land location my property is situated in. But again was told this report isn't completed although it's been in the making for some time. A meeting was held on the 21st of January with the Shire and this was something else. Effectively the response from the planning department was the issue with the application is with the farm management report. This is the first time that I was told of this and how, how is this the case since you've had my application since October and it's now end of January. I asked what was wrong with it. I was told it reflects rural living rather than farming activity. I asked is there a criteria or a guideline I meet, need to meet? I was told no. I stated, and this is completely open for personal interpretation of the planning department in which they agreed and said this was their personal view. I asked if there is no criteria or guideline to this report, what in exactly in the report I need to address. I was told it is not the job or role of the planning department to coach the community through this process. I again questioned what can I do to satisfy the planning department's personal view and was told regardless as to how I amend the port report and even if I submit an entire new report, they would still be recommending refusal and it would go to the meeting today. I have read the officer's report again, which I sent through to you yesterday, and also have a copy in here if you haven't had a chance to read it, to quote a couple of inconsistencies, and due to time limitations, I won't go through them all, but a few things. Page five um, states that the application cannot be supported due to bushfire risk, but two pages later states that the sitting of the dwelling minimises bushfire risk. Page six states that there's no dams, that's factually incorrect, we're in a drought and there's no water in it. Um, and page 11, on the basis of the engineer's report that the application should not be supported. I personally contacted the engineering company and spoke to the director, which also confirms this is factually incorrect. This is not a prohibited use, and I believe there is no justifiable reason by the planning, from the planning scheme as to why I cannot live on my own farm. I'm not asking to subdivide the property at all, and I'm certainly not asking to build a prohibited use on the property. My dwelling will increase the agricultural activity on the land, as clearly outlined in the farm management report submitted, and will ensure suitable management for a productive outcome. It will ensure the management of the property is appropriate, so that there is no negative implications on any of the surrounding state forest and farms. Just to reiterate to you all, I just want a permit to construct my own home on my own property. That's it. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Oh, amazing. I had it at seven minutes a couple of days ago. Yes, um, Jamie, would you um, entertain us with the um, officer that said that they had a conflict of interest? That would be Martin Island. Okay, thank you. We'll follow up with that one. Um, the cost of the $15,000 to date that you've spent, is that wholly and solely to do with the farm management report or was there additional costs there? Um, well, I've had to obviously, under the recommendations of the Shire, um, it was uh, highlighted that that's something that needed to be focused on. So, of course, I couldn't complete that myself. So, I employed a consultant to do that. So, that includes her fees, obviously the farm management fees, um, and then also I had to get different reports done as well for the process, such as the engineering report. That's all, Mr Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Peltz. Any other questions? Oh, thank you, Jamie. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from uh, our planner, Mr Hollows. Welcome. Thank you, Mr Mayor and Councillors. Um, tonight, as you all heard, this is for application for use and development of a dwelling at uh, Great Alpine Road in Sarsfield. Councillors, probably going back to the beginning, um, yes, this is an application that can be approved. It's for use and development of a dwelling. If it was a prohibited use, we would have identified that. We would have come here and said it's a prohibited use and we would recommend refusal on that basis, which we have not done today. 
uh, councillors. There was many, many issues that were raised there that I know are being uh, looked at internally. Um, but councillors, I don't intend to go through everything blow by blow. Councillors, because this is a subjective matter, because you're looking at an application that can either be approved or refused, it is up to permanent applicants to, sh to demonstrate why they need a dwelling on the land in order to carry out an agricultural use. That's why most people lodge a farm management plan. That's why you'll see in the tribunal from about 28 decisions we've seen is why people lodge farm management plans is to justify the reason I need to live here is because we are doing A, B, C and D. Yes, it is true that we've approved some uh, uh, dwellings in the farming zone and we have provided a memorandum to councillors identifying those and you will note that many of them have different um, locations, different um, reasons for the dwelling being placed on the land and also note that there are different um, uh, requirements that need to be addressed by those people who live in those dwellings. So councillors, we just formally go back to the planning scheme and say, state policy seeks that farming zone land is utilised for farming zone purposes. The local planning policy directs that development should be in those areas for dwellings, for rural living zones, low density residential zones, and obviously other residential zones like the general residential zone. This land is farming zone, so therefore there is a decision that needs to be made on whether or not the council will permit the use and development of a dwelling. The um, application as we see it does not demonstrate that there is a nexus on the need to live on the property in order to carry out an agricultural pursuit as identified in the farming zone. Council is happy to take questions. Thank you, Mr. Hollows. Councillor Ellis. Just a couple of uh, questions I have, Mr. Hollows, to commence. Um, just to the first one is a clarification on the agricultural use of the farm, and, and I'm asking the question, is it gra cattle grazing? Is that the intended use? Uh, the intended use is for some vegetable plots, uh, a chicken coop, and to graze some cattle. I don't know the number of the cattle to be grazed. Thank you. Um, in the report, which has been published in the agenda, and I'll, re and I'll return to this, um, uh, you state approval of dwelling on this land will increase pressure to rezone the land for rural residential outcomes. This cannot be supported due to bushfire risk. And I've been out there to that property and looked around there, and so I'm, I would like to gain an understanding of this um, statement, please. Can you understand, uh, explain to me how the pressure, uh, there will be pressure arising to further subdivide this property and where is the bushfire risk? So, councillors, there is a large Crown land reserve to the north of this property, so that's where the bushfire risk has predominantly come from. Councillors, when you tend to have dwellings placed on farming zone land for the purposes of simply a dwelling, Along comes the pressure to rezone land for rural living purposes. In this case, there has been no um, planning scheme amendment and no strategic basis for anything like that to occur. Um, and that's where we get those statements from. Thank you, Mr. I have one, one minor question. Um, there is restriculated water available with no sewage. I just want to clarify that again. I haven't, haven't seen it in any of the paperwork. Yeah, that, that's correct. There's no sewage available. Councillor Peltz. Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. Mr Hollows, um, can you please define the difference for us, all of us, to understand um, the difference between rural residential zone land and rural living zone land, please? So rural, rural living zone land is a zone within the planning scheme, as farming zone is a zone within the planning scheme. What you have to consider here is obviously outcomes that can occur on all those lots. So if you have a dwelling on rural living zone land, there's an expectation if you buy rural living zone land that a dwelling would be an outcome that would be uh, supported by council. If you purchase a farming zone property, it's not necessarily an outcome to allow for a rural living outcome, i.e. you're living on a, on a property for a lifestyle reason. 
the outcome expected is for agriculture. Okay, thank you. Um, these blocks, they were purchased late last year and I remember driving past them and thinking, oh, I'd love to live on Puggle Lane. Because the address sounds really cute. And I just thought, well, they would be nice lifestyle blocks. Um, the new owner um, was unable to fulfil their expectations of building their ideal lifestyle properties um, and it's misleading. Um, farmers within um, these big blocks and they're subdividing them off, um, I believe there should be, if they're not allowed to build on them, the farmers shouldn't be able to subdivide these blocks off and I think the framework um, is misleading or there's some concept there in the equation that isn't suitable um, because you're misleading people to believe they can actually achieve something when you're saying they can't. Um, and with that stated, um, I look at a lot of blocks down in Melbourne and they are, you know, urbanised and they are exactly farm, farmlet blocks and, you know, to me I wonder why they're able to do that and we're not able to do that up here. And I know you're going to say to me, These, this land up here is recognised as agricultural land of significance, but how do you know the development of what they're going to place on that land isn't going to be significantly more than what was previously on that land and therefore they need to live on it? Okay, so I might take that in a few parts. Uh -huh. um, so the land was created by, it was a property that had several Crown allotment parcels, which means you can apply to the titles office to have those parcels turn into an individual title and therefore it can be legally disposed of as freehold land. In terms of your commentary about some people would like to live there for a lifestyle purpose, that's fine. It's not necessarily misleading to have in the planning scheme, because it is consistent throughout the state, that you can apply for the use and development of a dwelling on those properties. You can. It's about ensuring that there's a nexus between the dwelling and the agricultural use on that property. It's not the fact that it's a right. It's not a right. The planning scheme across the state doesn't give it a right. It says you may apply to do so, and then it's for the consideration of the chambers. Um, in terms of um, Melbourne, in terms of um, some of the development you see there, often uh, promoted by the relevant shires and councils, often through very, very intense strategic processes, including the urban um, growth authorities. So there is often a, a aim to allow Melbourne to grow, but grow in a contained manner because they do not wish to see this type of sprawl on the outskirts of Melbourne. Um, so if I may um, just question that further. Um, when you actually subdivide a block and you get a freehold land use, does it state on that title that it is not to be built on for the purpose of a dwelling? No, it won't. The only time when that's, a, that's in a case is if there's been a subdivision undertaken of freehold land and council decides to put a legal agreement on it to say it can't be developed for the purposes of a dwelling. You've seen a number of those last year where that, that was op offered up as a condition. That forms a legal agreement and the legal agreement is showing up on the title. Okay. I have one last question, if I may. Um, and I'm curious as to how much of this um, application is council officers personal opinion and how much of it is actual factually based. Uh, my view is council officers have reviewed the application in light of the planning scheme. So it's not a personal opinion of an officer, it's been assessed against the planning scheme as their professional role requires them to do. Thank you, Councillor Peltz. Uh, Councillor Tui, you had a question. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, Aaron, just in regards to the farm management plan, um, how long have we been requiring farm management plans? It depends on a case-by-case -case basis because sometimes it's just simply not warranted. Um, as you would have seen from the uh, memorandum that was provided to councillors, there are some people that are replacing a dwelling on a very small parcel of land, and you just simply wouldn't put someone through the rigmarole for the sake of it. 
Um, no one's going to necessarily farm a two hectare block of land where they're replacing an existing dwelling because it's gone into uh, a disrepair. Um, so you won't require those sort of situations. In others, yes, it's required because it's, it's actually a way for applicants to demonstrate to planning officers that yes, there will be an agricultural use placed on this land and it will be maintained. Um, and that allows obviously planning officers to come to a decision more readily. So in, in terms of time, that requirement has been for how long? Oh, in terms of time, that's been around um, about 18 months within our office, but uh, across the state it's been there for many, many years. So can I ask what prompted the requirement to come into play 18 months ago? Yeah, council officers have been reviewing decisions of the tribunal very keenly, and uh, it's clearly evident that the tribunal uses this tool to come to a decision itself. So uh, do we have um, somebody who's qualified to understand a farm management plan and what's involved there? And are we also clear in regards to applicants where that information can be gained so that they can uh, have the ability to write a, a farm management plan that is, is along the lines of what council is asking for? Yeah, look, we, we take it um, very seriously to sit down with um, individuals and talk them through what's involved in a farm management plan. When an application is lodged by a planning consultant, we'll have less time about that because planning consultants do make themselves aware of these sorts of requirements and they do look at tribunal decisions on a regular basis. Um, and is someone qualified? Farm management plans are written in a way that demonstrates that the land will be used for agricultural purposes for the benefit of the planner looking at the application. So it's written for and to highlight to planners why the dwelling is required to be on the land for agricultural purpose. Mayor. Um, so that would then dictate to me that it would depend on the planner who looked at the, um, at the plan as to whether uh, that farm management plan was acceptable or not. It's not just uh, a planner, it's often a group of planners within the office will consider it and uh, have discussions about it. Indeed, recently um, there was consideration of an application where uh, the initial reaction was, I don't think there's a need for the dwelling, um, and I reviewed it, um, had some further discussions with the permit applicant, and determined that the property was going to be farmed and there was a need for the dwelling to be there. It just needed to be highlighted in the actual plan. Um, thank you for that. The other, the other question I had, and uh, I think Councillor Ells pointed it out, um, where it, it does state in here, approval of a dwelling on this land will increase pressure to rezone the land. Um, now, we, uh, council, are in charge of whether that rezone happens or not. That would have to come through council, is that correct? Correct. So, regardless of what may or may not happen, the decision to rezone that land would come to council. So, I don't see um, that, or, would have to go through a planning minister. Um, but that's that's not going to, just because um, approval may or may not happen, doesn't change what might happen in regards to uh, rezoning of the land because that's, a, that's a, something that is made, a decision is made by council or the minister, not people. Yeah, a decision would be made by council and the minister, both. Um, but what you will find is that with the proliferation of dwellings in the farming zone, um, there becomes a situation where you question whether or not the activities in that precinct or that area is actually any longer farming. And that's why the pressure comes back on council to consider rezoning the property or properties. Councillor Rotino. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Hollow, um, in relation to the farm management plan, I just wanted to pick up on Councillor Tui's point. Um, 
with other aspects of planning where we don't have the expertise, we refer to referral authorities. So does the farm plan go to AgVic or who does it go to? No, there isn't any statutory referral authority set up for farm management plans. Um, and I reiterate that it's a tool that is used by planning consultants across the state and the tribunal to actually inform planners about what agricultural outcomes are going to occur um, so that we can either make a decision, is there a need for the dwelling on the property or is there not, and have to make a value judgment against the overall planning policies of the scheme. Uh, thank you. Um, I've heard um, you tell us that the planning scheme's not perfect. So to fix it up, we get the statutory planning right the strategic planning right and the statutory planning looks after itself. So to try and address this, we, we've been waiting uh, since 2016 for a rural land use strategy to help address the very issue that we're dealing with here tonight. Um, it's, it's still not finished, there's a fair bit of work still to go on it and given um, some of the stuff that's happening, I think we're sending out mixed messages in what we're trying to achieve here. Um, well, firstly, councillor, you'll be aware that the rural land use strategy is being um, developed at this time. Um, in terms of mixed messages, I would just reiterate that the planning scheme has been around for many, many years, and it has always been consistent in, um, I think it was rural A, rural one, and now farming zone, which they've all, all these zones have moved into farming zone that there is always a need to apply for a permit under 40 hectares to use and develop land for the purpose of dwelling. And there's been consistent policy in respect to the need for the dwelling to be on the land for the purpose of agriculture. That hasn't changed and I'm, I'm comfortable that the planning scheme has maintained a consistent line about that matter and a consistent line through those state provisions and it is consistently and should be consistently understood, not just by planning officers within council, external planning consultants, and anyone else that's in the development uh, stakeholders groups within any shire, that if you're on a farming zone property less than 40 hectares, you know you need to get a planning permit to use and develop a dwelling on it, and that you know you have to justify why the dwelling's required on the property for the purpose of agriculture. So I am, I do believe, planning schemes have been consistent in that space very much. We have um, <coughs> Councillor Ellis wishes to ask a question, please, um, and we might just restrict it to questions only rather than commentary from this stage on, please. I think I kept to questions and it's a follow on from Councillor Tui's question, because it blurred, blurred it a little. And that is that um, according to the published report in the agenda, the, um, there's no structural settlement boundary for the, for the locality of Sarsfield and that directly across the road from uh, the applicant's premises is a, a settlement, if I can use that loose term, of four hectare block blocks. Taking into account that, is there any, anything to um, preclude the applicant at a later time making an application to uh, turn the, the, the applicant's property into part of this settlement by creating further, say, four, acre, uh, four hectare blocks uh, on, that, on the applicant's property? Uh, nothing would preclude the applicant uh, lodging a private planning scheme amendment to rezone the land. Um, that would be a process, as Councillor Tui said, of lodging the necessary strategic documentation and being able to justify that process and that rezoning, firstly through Council and secondly, secondly through the Minister of Planning. Councillor Buckley. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, with the sewerage thing, uh, that doesn't affect the planning permit, does it at all, if there's uh, sewerage there or not? Because, see, you know, I know long drop dunnies and no good anymore, but the, uh, you'd have, uh, uh, you know, satisfactory sewerage systems, you know, a septic tank and that sort of thing. Thank you. Mr. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, you can easily um, 
service this property through a septic tank system. Thank you. If there are no more questions, Councillor Retino. Yes. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move an alternate motion. So I'll, I'll see if we can get it up on the screen. So we, we, we have an alternative motion moved by Councillor Rotino and seconded by Councillor Peltz. I'm happy to read it out, Mr. Mayor, if we can't. Yeah. Here we go. Magic. Uh, the alternate motion that the council being a responsible authority and having considered all the relevant planning matters determines that planning permit application 335-29MP is consistent with the requirements and objectives of the East Gippsland planning scheme and therefore resolves to issue a planning permit for use and development of the land for a dwelling and outbuilding and creation of access to a road zone category one at CA4 section B1359 Great Alpine Road Sarsfield subject to the following permit conditions. Uh, one, before the development commences, amended plans to the satisfaction of the responsible authority must be submitted. To just, just to, just to um, jump across you, uh, it's, it's a very long document. I think um, just the, the headlines would be sufficient at this stage. Okay, well, uh, the bold bit then. Maybe just note the number of conditions, how many yep. conditions are there, Council? On that they are yeah. large. So, can we talk to it now? It's good. Yeah. No, it's true. Could I, could I please uh, get some advice from um, from one of our managers as to uh, how how I'm would happy you to proceed? Read it if you to read it. Well, I need a point of clarification. F firstly, I'm firstly, I'll just ask. Be put, Mayor. Without reading it. You have a motion on the table that to be put. To be put. Put. I'll take in the put. Yeah, we've already done that. So would any? So, Councillor Retino, would you like to speak? No. 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 The motion is just. Put, all right. So we're just going yeah. to vote. <laughs> so, the alternative <laughs> motion. <laughs> yes, Councillor Pelt, seconded it. So, so, so we we uh, we will put it to the vote, <laughs> and all those in favour of the alternative motion. Put it. Was Councillor Ellis, Councillor Ellis, um, Councillor Councillor Ellis, please? I, I saw a slightly raised arm. Was that a? Are you putting yes, or not? It is, Mr. A yes. You should put two. Unanimous. <laughs> so, Mr. Mayor, thank you for your indulgence. But in the absence of the uh, strategic document that I referred to, the Rural Land Use Strategy, and based on the precedence of the 18 approvals in the past 12 months, uh, I hereby move this recommendation. Thank you. And we have uh, you yes, seconded, like Councillor Pelt. My um, fellow counterpart, um, Councillor Rotino, um, on the grounds that we have been waiting a very long time for the um, the strategies that we've asked for, and um, I think with the consistency of what we've already approved, I think it is consistent with what we've previously approved. And so, in that case, I think it's um, I'm happy to support the motion. Um, I did have one question about the um, dot point one before the development commences, amended plans to the satisfaction of the responsible authority. And I'm curious as to what that would highlight too. Councillor Peltz, we've, we've, we've gone um, beyond questions at this stage. So we'll just, uh, we'll just stick with the motion. I'd like to speak to it too. Councillor Reeves. Yep, I'll just point out that um, 
In reference to the planning officers and the work that they've done uh, with respect to their following the guidelines, that that, uh, that is their job and I think they have done that, but the decision falls on us as councillors and this is uh, of, of no diminishing of the, counts, the, the officers' work, but the decision has to come to us and that's what we're doing here. So this is not about uh, who's right and who's wrong, it's about um, making a decision, councillors, and on this particular occasion, uh, and in reference and uh, consideration of what's been presented to me, I'm very happy to support this motion. Thank you, Councillor Roves. So I'll put the um, I'll put this to the vote. All those in favour? Sorry, what have we done now? And just on the hope, because this. Uh, this amended uh, motion came to us fairly late, and I'm just hoping that the applicant is cognizant of some of the the um, one to uh, what is it now 16 conditions that are attached to this. Um, some of them are fairly onerous and uh, uh, require that the farming activities become a predominant activity on the property. So I'm accepting of the different points and I'd also um, acknowledge the points that uh, <coughs> Mr Hollows has put to us. I find that uh, normally that I would follow the process as he puts forward but in this case um, provided that the applicant is very uh, is compliant with this so I'm prepared to support it. Thank you Councillor Ellis. I would actually like to, uh, Mr Canazaro because we are in the middle of um, of a motion, but he would like to uh, clarify a few items for us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, the, the uh, motion's been put. We should be voting on it now. That was as I suspected, and uh, Councillor Ellis has said that's right, but he still managed to speak. <laughs> so, so uh, I would now, as I tried before, I put this to the vote. All those in favour? We have a unanimous decision. Thank you, councillors. Thank you, Mr. Hollows. Councillors, please, um, as, as, the, as the gallery has left, we now have uh, up to uh, item 5.2, which is good governance, and 5.2.1 is a finance report for the period ending 31 December 2019, and it's authored and spoken to by Ms Liz Collins. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillors, this is the financial report for the six months to the 31st of December. And I just want to make a, um, a few uh, comments regarding the report. At the time, 31st of December, we were still in business as usual. We'd been closed for that Christmas New Year period. So this report is very much about the state of play as it was and as it was forecast to be at the 31st of December. And we all know um, what has happened um, you know, in recent times. The, the report, whilst here, you know, reporting on things the councillors probably had already been briefed on in terms of the change to the expected operating surplus as a result of, you know, carried forward projects primarily and some changed um, grant funding um, still applied to this report. But as we know, there's many things that have happened since the 31st of December. And whilst we try and gather that information and in terms of what that m might mean for Council's um, operating position for the 1920 year, um, we will work through those as this information comes to hand. We will have additional expenditure, as we all know, for various reasons um, through the relief and the recovery process from this terrible event. We will also have and um, already have been advised of a number of um, funds or 
I'll call them um, grants and funds that have been provided to council um, for certain activities um, in terms of recovery and, um, and other processes that council will be managing over the next period of time. What I've proposed in the report is that um, a report, or what's proposed, is that a monthly report rather than a quarterly report come to council so that council and the community are kept informed as we work through and gain further information um, so that uh, we are understanding what the financial position and the implications, not only of the grants, grants that have been made available to council where decisions have to be made, but also of the costs going forward. So um, whilst this was very much a business as usual, and it does seem odd given what's happened, um, that was the state of play for the 31st of December um, with further information, both also um, noting not only expenditure impacts, but we also know we will have some significant impacts on some of our income areas, um, and particularly for activities um, at the caravan park, such as the Malakuta Holiday Park and other areas of council. So we have to work through those and we'll bring that information forward each month with updated forecasts for council. There is a recommendation there. Happy to take some quest um, any questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Any questions, councillors? Councillor Rotino. Your um, you, you wish to speak, yes. Sorry, I had a question. I had a question. Yes, we, yeah, I was ask, only asking for questions. I Liz, thank, thanks again, as always, for you and your um, colleagues' diligent work. And I note the recommendation, councillor, says that we adopt the finance report for the six month period ending 31 December. And it's probably, and it is a true and accurate rec record of what happened till then. Is it the best thing to adopt it, or should we note it at this stage just because of the changes, or? What do you think? I don't think there's an issue with adopting the report as it is, because it is noted in the report that there, that there will be um, changes happening and that a monthly report will then come to council um, as well. So I don't think there's any implications in adopting rather than noting it. Any other questions? All right, well, our recommendation, sorry, Joe. <laughs> hey guys, you're in a hurry. I was about to read the recommendation in full and then put it to the vote, but uh, obviously you're satisfied you've read, read that. And uh, so we have it uh, moved by Councillor Rotino and seconded by Councillor Reeves. You may wish to speak. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, Liz, to your team, the finance team and all the support staff. Um, you know, we're talking about everybody that's been impacted with these fires and our staff as, as the Mayor alluded to, we're all impacted and um, the scenario planning and, and the what if planning that you've done for us has, has put us in good stead. So I'd just like to thank you, take this opportunity to thank you for all that hard work and acknowledge all our staff that have been working uh, tirelessly to uh, keep on top of this um, issue that we're dealing with. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Rotino. So if there is no more, uh, no one else wishes to speak, uh, we'll put this to the vote. All those in favour? Thank you, councillors. We have a unanimous vote. Now, before you go, Ms Collins, you have another item? Thank you, Mr Mayor. And I guess it follows on very nicely from at the discussion then and the comments made. Council um, very early, um, follow, following the, um, the bushfire um, disasters, um, sat down and looked at what immediate relief they may be able to give to ratepayers um, and being able to do that in an informed manner, obviously there's some further information required so that more generally what, are, what other options might there be for ratepayers. But one of the things that council could do immediately was um, to look at, in this case, the um, interest, the application of any penalty interest that may have normally applied to late payment of rates, as well as to also consider 
um, the way that we um, undertake any applications for financial hardship consideration. So this report has a number of recommendations. Uh, the first recommendation is in relation to all um, rates for 1920 year for all ratepayers and um, allowing a um, payment, if the payment of rates are made um, at a later period by the 31st of, of May 2020, um, that no pen penalty interest be applied if they were going to be a full payer at 15th of February or for the second instalment due the 29th of February. So they had that additional time without application of penalty interest. It's also recommending that for the um, properties within the bushfire affected area that, that those properties have a deferment of the requirement to pay their 1920 rates through to June 2021 without the application of penalty interest if they pay by that time. And that gives council time to look at what other um, support they might be able to provide to rate payers through a whole range of, of different options. Um, also added into the report was um, prior to this time, <coughs> um, in, when considering applications for financial hardship of a ratepayer, we've just used the provisions of the Local Government Act and we have a committee that assesses those and we process those. Um, we did have a draft policy which we further reviewed and added in some further commentary to accommodate situations such as this when we have a natural disaster and have developed three different types of application forms which were attached to the um, draft policy um, that is appended to this report. Um, this was to make application by a ratepayer who was in financial hardship um, as a direct result of a natural disaster, in this case a bushfire, um, as simple as possible without um, placing too much of a burden on that ratepayer in terms of the amount of information that's required. There's many other ways that we can check some of the information and we may have to request some further information, but to make that process um, simple and as painless as possible and encouraging people to come forward if they are in that financial hardship um, situation to, and then for us to assess what we can do to assist. So, um, so there are a number of recommendations there um, and uh, for Council's consideration. And, and I believe there may be a slight amendment to the final recommendation also that, um, that has been provided just to, in clarifying um, recommendation number five. So the amended recommendation is up there. The only change was to number five. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Uh, now, questions, Councillor? Councillor Tui wishes to ask you a question. Um, thanks, Liz. Um, <clears throat> I, I probably should have asked this earlier on, but I didn't, um, I didn't read. Point two, just in regards to deferring payments, which means putting them off, not cancelling them. Um, a defer, defer payment for all 1920 rates and charges for all properties identified as being in the impacted areas until 30 June 2021 with no penalty interest to be applied for that period. Now, if people's houses have been burnt down, which quite a number have, what payment will be deferred? Uh, that is to say, their, their property now is different to what it was. Thanks, Councillor Tui. Absolutely, and um, there would be an, an adjustment then made to their 1920 rate payments. So it's whatever that 1920 um, rates and charges ends up being with those adjustments, then those rate payers will have the option to extend their payment time. Many of them may not take up that option um, because they may be on, you know, um, monthly direct debits and wish to keep those going or they may amend their payment amount but certainly that's just providing that option but on the uh, the adjustments would all be processed so it would be a lesser amount obviously than what it was yes councillor pounds yes with a follow-up from that liz if i may um 
So prior to December 30, when the first um, bushfire hit severely in our region, the people's rates were presumably the same as normal. So you've got virtually six months of rate at a no rates at a normal price. So after the 30th, 31st of December, things changed then and then the next episode started the 4th of January where it um, took out the rest of the region and it's still ongoing now. But my curious thoughts are how, are, how will we make the process between um, paying the first six months of rate and then paying the next six months of rate with a discount, um, considering people have lost um, major assets um, off their property. So I'm curious as to how that might look. Thank you, Councillor Pals. The, um, the process to have those properties, um, the, their values, which would, if um, all of the, the buildings destroyed, it would go back down to a site value. So the value of the um, improvements is, is taken off and then the rates adjusted accordingly for the six months. Now, that might mean potentially some people, if they've been paying their rates, may be in credit. We would ask them if they would like a refund or to leave it there as a credit for future payments, but that would be up to the rate payer. And that's, um, yes, yeah, so there is an adjustment done. Um, and if they're on instalments, instalments get adjusted, etc. Yes. Councillor Ellis. Simply, um, if there are no further questions, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd be happy to move the motion that's laid on the table. So, councillors, before that's moved, there are no more questions. All right, so we have this um, recommendation is uh, moved by Councillor Ellis and seconded by Councillor Reeves. So I'll put that to the vote. Okay. Speak, do you wish to speak to it? There you go. I can <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll, I'll keep my words first, because I think that the, um, the motion before council exhibits what the wish of council to take, provide an, an, an understanding for its rate payers and the people affected by the fires in this particular horrid uh, bushfire season. It's straightforward and it deserves the support of all councillors uh, at this table. I look forward to looking at other ways in which we can further assist members of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ellis. Um, we've gone past the questions, but Councillor Reeves, would you wish to speak? Yeah, and um, reiterating those comments from Councillor Ellis, the uh, the work that's gone into this at um, in, a, in a stressful time for officers and councillors as well to put together um, a foundational hardship policy, which has driven driven what's going on in terms of the processes, is uh, to be commended. And I wanted to thank the officers for doing that, the hardship policy in particular. That um, should be noted here um, that this is the the beliefs and values that drives our actions and, uh, and I think that's really important and thank you very much for being so responsive as officers to the needs of our community in these times. So uh, I'm glad that I'm not having to read that but somebody will I'm sure. Councillor, Councillor Rattino you wish to make a comment also? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to uh, reinforce the comments that have already been made uh, and just uh, adding that right here, right now, this is not just a, a responsible response to the disaster that we've uh, endured in our region, but it's the right thing to do. Thank you. We're just checking a formality um, about whether we read that off the screen, but I believe um, we don't need to, and we can uh, put it to the vote. So all those in favour of this recommendation. Thank you, councillors. Um, well done, That's, uh, and thank you, Liz, and thank you to your officers for all that work. It's unanimous.
Yeah, our councillors, we have uh, we have 5.2.3, which is our meeting schedules, and uh, I'd ask Mr. Canazaro to speak on this item. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll, I'll take the report as read, but the report seeks to set out council meeting times for 2000 or 2020. Um, we have um, included in the council meeting schedules three council and community <coughs> meetings, which um, we have brought forward into the first half of this year. Um, and also um, that provides uh, you know, great contact with those communities uh, prior to the council meeting as well. Uh, we've also included that there will be no winter recess in July and um, the rationale for that is it pr allows us to have uh, more meetings to cover the wide number of items and subjects that we cover in a year. Um, so the recommendation is, is before you. Um, the table sets out the meeting dates and times um, through uh, 4th of Feb through to 8th of December with varying times and varying locales. So I, I uh, uh, present the recommendation to Council for um, consideration. Thank you, uh, Mr. Canazaro. Councillor uh, O'Connell, you wish to speak? Um, well, if there's no further questions or any questions, I'd like to move an amendment to the um, report. Uh, thank you. Would uh, anyone like to uh, second? Councillor Reeves has seconded it. So are there any questions regarding the, um, the alternative? I'm not sure that you can second the amendment until the amendment is actually shown. So Councillor O'Connell would need to, yeah, Councillor O'Connell would need to speak to the amend, well, would need to present the amendment so that, um, so Councillor O'Connor will need to speak to the amendment of the item. All right, please, Councillor O'Connell. And thank you, Councillor Reeves, for dropping me in it again. Clarified, <laughs> is it an alternative motion or a brand, uh, that motion because we haven't, don't have a motion before us? I believe in its amendment because it's just an amendment to some times on the, from the original schedule. Right, okay. So the um, amended times are on the 7th of April and the 23rd of June, 7th of July and the 4th of August from 6 to 1 p.m. Thank you, Councillor O'Connell. So I believe we can now accept second. a seconder. Yes. Thanks, Mayor. I'll second it now then. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Reeves. Thank you. We'll save it up for next time. Anyone wish to, um, to speak on this amendment or this adjustment? No? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, the meeting times that have been amended um, are to reflect um, some school holiday times and also to um, reduce the amount of time travelling for some of the councillors and also um, the school holiday times for other councillors who um, are not able to make it outside of school holiday times. So it's a... Um, a compromise to accommodate all councillors to be able to um, make the council meetings and also um, as a duty of care to those councillors who travel uh, long distances um, home after meetings, um, particularly during the winter months uh, when it's dark quite early. Um, this will um, ensure that we are not on the road um, during late hours. Thank you, Councillor O'Connell. No one else wishes? Okay, I would say that we can put this to the vote. So all those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, councillors.
sorry, Mr. Mayor. I think um, that is right. Um, how All right, so if we need to vote, could we, do we need a mover or is it just a vote? Yes. Just the vote. Could we have someone from? I'll now move that. I don't have to, no, okay. Just, just the vote, all right, all those in favour. That's unanimous also. My apologies. Now we have urgent and other business and uh, I believe Councillor Rotino would like to uh, speak to this. Uh, Mr Mayor, I'd like to move a, uh, an item of urgent business uh, around roads of strategic importance. Seconded by Kelly. Yes, those uh, we accept this um, urgent and other business. So, um, well, I'm happy to second that we accept this urgent and other business. Thank you, Councillor Reeves. All right, so let's let's go. We'll, we'll put. We'll, how did we go with that? Did we get that confusion sorted. We now have Councillor Peltz. Correct. Absolutely. All right, so uh, we vote on this now. If do, so all those in favour of Councillor Rotino's motion? Right, oh, that's you know, accepting, accepting the, the motion. So we have, that has been um, unanimously passed. Councillor Rotino. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I, I'd like to move a motion um, that the Mayor write to the Honourable Michael McCormack, Deputy Prime Minister, and Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development, asking the Princess Highway, Snowy Monero Highway, and the Great Alpine Road are significant corridor roads for our LGA, and that these roads be classified as roads of strategic importance. Um, point two, that the Mayor write in support of the Bega Valley Shire uh, to support their request to the Honourable Michael McCormack. Um, again, he's the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development, seeking that the Princess Highway be classified as a road of strategic importance, linking both our cross-border LGAs and communities. Uh, point three, that the Mayor write to the Gippsland Local Government Network, GLGN, and the Canberra Joint Organisation, CRJO, seeking their support in points one and two of this motion. And fourth, uh, that the Mayor write to the Victorian New South Wales Cross-Border Commissioners seeking their support for the Princess Highway and Snowy Monero Highway to be classified as roads of strategic importance. Councillor Peltz, you wish to speak? Yes, I do. Um, Joe, if you would like to entertain, I, I think that the, um, the Prime Minister should actually have a Guernsey in this as well because he's, um, he's entertained and he's seen um, for evidence the issues that we've had to face over the last um, six, six weeks of the Princess Highway being closed to our communities and um, transport operations um, not at all happening in our region, lack of... of um, yeah. I think, I think he should be mentioned in this too, if you'd like to entertain it. Okay, thank you, Councillor Powers. I'd be happy to include the Prime Minister as well. So, so councillors are happy to accept that um, we've included the Prime Minister in, uh, in the letters. Thank you, Councillor Peltz. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Following uh, the recent uh, bushfire disaster across East Gippsland Shire, where in excess of 60% of our uh, LGA has been impacted, 
it's become apparent that we have three key critical road corridors that are the lifeblood of our region and numerous communities. Uh, these communities lie east-west along the Princess Highway and north-south along the Snowy Monero Highway and the Great Alpine Road. These vital regional roads satisfy the definition used by the federal government to have these roads classified as roads of strategic importance, or ROSI, as the acronym is known. There are numerous uh, feeder roads that operate off these main roads and act as critical connectors to our uh, wonderful remote communities. These roads, Princess Highway, Snowy Monero Highway and Great Alpine Road need to remain operable. Rossi will deliver priority work such as road sealing, disaster immunity resilience. Uh, being included as Rossi roads, these will receive works including strengthening and widening pavement, rehabilitation, bridge and culvert upgrades and road realignments opening up corridors to provide a more reliable and safe road network, improve access to higher capacity vehicles, better connect regional communities and facilitate tourism opportunities. And that uh, is part of the Rossi definition of why you would classify something as a, a road of strategic importance. Improved access provided through Rossi will deliver substantial social and economic benefits, including opportunities for greater regional employment and business growth. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rotino. Councillor Pelch, you wish to speak? Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'm pleased to be supporting this motion, um, not only because Joe has raised it and it's timely, um, the fact that our communities have been um, affected greatly by the closure of the Princess Highway, the Great Alpine Road and the Can Valley Monaro Highway. Um, it has isolated many of our communities over the last six weeks and um, we have had no, we have, we will also be um, suffering from economic benefit, dis, dis benefit from this for probably the next two years um, as a, an account of it to our transport businesses um, and just also our lack of um, tourism um, patronage for our businesses in the community. So um, we have felt this greatly. Um, this particular issue is something that the SEATS group, um, which is the South Eastern Australian Transport Systems, raised with the federal government 18 months ago. They partitioned um, to, and they delivered it to the Honourable Speaker, members of the Upper and the Lower House. Um, I'll read it to you. This petition is um, concerning people of Australia, draws the attention to the Senate and the House of Representatives to the poor condition of the sections of the Princess Highway east of Sale and to Wollongong. Um, it represents a huge area that is probably covers two million people um, and they too in the southern part of New South Wales have been greatly affected by the bushfires um, at the same time or not, not un, not un, what, probably not un similar in time if not a little bit later than what we actually have. Um, the petition goes on to state um, the road of importance issue um, originally back before the 1975. The Princess Highway had um, the recognition of being a road of national importance and the petition that this was um, derived towards was to reinstate the road of national importance. The funding for the section between Sale and Wollongong was taken away and put towards the development of the Hume Highway, which was identified as the major freight route, but it didn't take into account the communities living in this region, the freight routes or the tourist routes that have now developed. Um, and it may be argued that it is a, a secondary road to the um, Hume Highway, but non nonetheless, it's important to our region and the welfare of our community. With that said, when you look at some of the Queensland roads that have been built, um, they also have a coastal road, which is of importance to them and their communities, but they also have inland freight networks that, um, that join up with the Hume Highway um, and other parts, uh, other major roads to connect our freight um, sections in Australia. The bottom line is this is a very important road to our community. We have suffered greatly and um, it's time that this road, this section was reinstated as a road of national importance. SEATS also does, um, 
does recognise and campaigns for major upgrades to the north-south um, routes, being the Alpine Road and the Can Valley Highway. And um, they've also had that as recognised as roads of importance um, on their on their journey um, and and receive significant upgrades to those roads when appropriate. With that stated, I'm delighted to be um, recognising um, this is a, a major thing for our community and um, I look forward to the support of the councillors around the table on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Peltz. Would any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Ellis. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd like to commend Councillor Rotino for this initiative of bringing this forward to Council. The recognition of uh, the Princes Highway and the links to Canberra and further on have been a long-term um, uh, ambition of, ca of this Council and of the SEATS organisation, as Councillor Peltz referred to just a moment ago, to, to upgrade and go provide quality uh, access to uh, the New South Wales coast and further places. Um, I encourage um, us uh, councillors to support this fresh initiative as a matter of urgency. I did the figures on the amount of monies available out of this particular initiative and noticed there's only about a billion dollars or one point, what do I see, $1.3 billion left for the rest of Australia after the disbursements the government have already provided in this program. The opening um, up of the Princess Highway and the news of that today is excellent news for us in our economy, which is suffering from the lack of a, of a major arterial road. I commend this uh, late, late minute um, motion to council as worthy of genuine support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ellis. Councillor Reeves, you wish to... Uh, thank you. So, from here I would say um, for Councillor Rotino's uh, um, motion, with all those in favour? Thank you, councillors. The vote is unanimous. Our next... next Now, anyway, our next... Uh, Okay, I'll allow that, uh, Councillor Buckley. Yes, yes, we've finished with that, so I'll allow, yeah, allow now, the question. We need a motion. A, a fellow down in uh, South Gibby uh, and uh, at Fish Creek sent us up a, a load of hay, uh, 44 of those big bales, and uh, could we lo uh, write him a, a sort of thank you letter? Do we need a motion for that, or could I just pass that over to you and... And, and we can do it without the formality of a motion. Uh, thanks, Councillor Buckley. No, that, we, we won't need a motion. In order, wouldn't it? No, yeah, we don't need a motion to accept yeah. um, your recommendation. And uh, we, if you give us the details, we can deal with a, a letter of thanks to that gentleman. Thank you. Now, the, our next item is, um, is for tenders, and uh, we need to uh, move. In camera. Mr. Mr. Mayor, I'm asked that Council move close the meeting to the public in accordance with provision uh, section 89, subsections 2D of the Local Government Act to consider item 7.1 as this item relates to a contractual matter. Thank you, Councillor Ellis. Seconder. We have a seconder. Councillor Roberts. All those in favour? Thank you, unanimous.